Uh, this is our uh, second event of our slimmed down Darwin Days uh, 2021. Um, uh, and we didn't have a theme this year, um, which seems kind of representative of the, of the year in general. So uh, uh, I thought, I started thinking about this as we were beginning to develop plans for Darwin Week um, a few months ago. And so tonight is kind of my ruminations on, uh, as a result of me thinking about what in the world would one talk about uh, at a Darwin celebration at this time of, in history. Um, everybody see that? Yep, you are, you are on. I'm on. Okay, well, um, so we, I can't, uh, I just want to uh, brag on, uh, on behalf of PRI and Cornell a little bit. This is the 15th year that we have celebrated Darwin Days in Ithaca. And we're not the oldest Darwin Day celebration by any means, but we're, uh, we're, we're, we're among the few that have been going for quite a while. And um, some of the remarks I'm going to make tonight are, are kind of based on that uh, that legacy of the last few of, of the last decade and a half, thinking about Darwin uh, in this kind of broader context at least once a year. Uh, so I don't know whether uh, I don't know what what all of your reactions to the last year are. Of course, I'm sure that they are many. Um, but in in my professional life, uh, one stops every once in a while and says, why do I do what I do? And so, as I said, I was beginning to ponder our Darwin celebration last fall. And I thought just briefly to myself, I said, what in the hell am I gonna say or anybody could say about Darwin uh, at this time in history? Uh, I'm sure some of you who are in this field uh, or have taken courses in this field, uh, have from time to time encountered people saying that what we do is somewhat esoteric or um, not necessary to the greater good or uh, counting angels on the heads of pins or whatever phrase you'd like to use, that, that this is kind of far from, from the mainstream of human affairs. Um, and that occurred to me in the last couple of months. What, what does thinking about evolutionary biology uh, have to do with the momentous earth shattering, humanity shattering issues that uh, we've all been thinking about in the last year. And so that's, that's the origin of, of these thoughts. Um, at the same time, some of you may know that we just had the 15th anniversary of the Kitzmiller uh, decision, uh, Kitzmiller v. Dover, or what's just sometimes called the Dover trial. Um, the, uh, for those of you who don't remember, uh, this uh, woman in the picture here was a uh, public school teacher in Dover, Pennsylvania, and uh, the local school board, uh, influenced by um, outsiders, particularly from the Discovery Institute and others, uh, decided that uh, in a particular version of creation science called intelligent design should be taught in the public schools in Dover, Pennsylvania. And Tammy Kitzmiller uh, was one of several teachers who thought that was ridiculous and uh, allowed her name to be put on a suit uh, that was put against the, the school board in Dover, Pennsylvania. And uh, this became uh, the, the kind of uh, trial that comes along every few decades on this subject in American history. And uh, it ended up in the courtroom of the gentleman you see on the lower left, uh, Judge John Jones III, uh, who was, as many people pointed out at the time, a, an appointee of, of uh, George W. Bush, uh, who was a lifelong Republican, um, who had never heard of intelligent design and didn't know much about evolution uh, when he first received the case. He very quickly figured out uh, or I shouldn't say figured out, he quickly made a decision uh, that uh, he would not just try to get this trial over with as fast as possible. He didn't, he wouldn't just sweep it under the rug. He very quickly made a decision 
that he would let this trial uh, run as long as he possibly could in order to the uh, to get the full arguments put out by both sides. And the reason for that is, he, he said, is that he saw this community tearing itself apart. It was quite dramatic. Friends stopped talking to friends. Family stopped talking to family, et cetera. Because he said he never wanted an American community to go through this again. And uh, when it was all over, uh, he issued his uh, decision between Christmas and New Year's of uh, 2005. Uh, and I remember that because we, we went to some trouble to post it uh, online at the time. And uh, it was a resounding decision that uh, the punchline of which I've put in the slide here, that intelligent design is not science and therefore uh, cannot be taught in public schools in the United States uh, because it would violate the separation of church and state. Uh, so that was 15 years ago. And um, if you've been, if you're, if you're in the, the, the creation watching business, uh, you may have noticed the National Center for Science Education celebrating this. They played a major role in, in helping prepare the, uh, the case uh, against the school board. It was a, it was a resounding triumph for uh, the teaching of evolution. And uh, intelligent design in this context has not reared its head since, uh, uh, confirming what most people had predicted at the time. But it sure was a big deal when it happened. Um, this is so long ago that we still could measure the significance of something by whether it appeared on the cover of these two magazines. It seems positively old fashioned now, uh, but it was a big deal at the time. Uh, it was mentioned in, uh, in, in the episodes of West Wing. It was, it was all the talk. Um, uh, PRI played a small role in it and got our picture in the New York Times uh, for training our volunteers to answer criticisms for creation. It's, uh, it was a big deal at the time. And to me, looking back on this 15 years ago, it seems almost quaint that we could have been so exercised by this. Uh, it was a big deal. It was a major trial. And had it gone the other way, it would have been a, a, a catastrophe for teaching biology in America. Uh, but in some ways, it seems so far away and so small. Uh, now compared to some of the issues that we've confronted uh, over the last 12 months. Well, fast forward a little ways to 2015 and 2016. Um, I actually gave a, a Darwin talk in early 2016 and uh, to a group in Syracuse. And my, my topic was uh, the 2016 science and the 2016 election. And uh, I did a little research uh, on all of the Republican candidates at the time and what their views were on evolution and climate change. And you, you might not even remember these times, they seem impossibly far away now, uh, but it was a, a huge uh, slate of Republican candidates in the primary at that time. Uh, and uh, they all had, amazingly, they all had public records on what they thought of evolution and climate change. And, uh, it was, uh, it was pretty appalling what they all said about those two topics. Uh, it, was, it was almost a race to see who could say the most anti-science thing uh, at the time. And at the very end of my, my summary of all these candidates came, came a, a, this guy. And I, uh, in my research, I found an interview with him um, uh, I guess it wasn't an interview. I guess it was a, a, a speech that he had given uh, the year before. And I'll just read you this. Uh, he says, uh, somebody asked him about evolution. And he said, you know, I don't really believe in that stuff. Man coming from monkeys and apes, I don't think so. We are much more advanced than animals. We are smarter by far. Could a monkey write the art of the deal? So you liberals can believe in evolution. You can trust the scientists. The same scientists, by the way, that push global warming even as New York gets colder and colder every winter. It's absurd. The American people agree with me about evolution. So that, it, it seems like so long ago, 2015, 2016, but there were clearly signs of, of what was to come. I guess I'll leave it at that. So that's, how, that's where I was thinking over the last uh, few months. And it, it gradually occurred to me that, that my, 
my concerns were misplaced, that I had been like, like all of us maybe, that I had been distracted by all of the unprecedentedness of the past year. And I needed to, to focus again and realize uh, why indeed I do what I do. And so tonight, I just wanna give you three thoughts. They're a little bit, perhaps uh, may seem a little bit disconnected, but I think they, they, uh, they carry a common thread that's worth thinking about. So I'm gonna suggest three things tonight, uh, some of which may seem obvious to you, but, but I think connectedly they form a, a, uh, a, a good way of thinking about this subject uh, on the eve of Darwin's birthday. Uh, first, we can't understand the current pandemic situation without understanding evolution. Um, second, we cannot understand the full effects of climate change without understanding evolution. And third, and, and maybe this is one of the more unexpected uh, things to think about, is that unlike the last 40 years or so, in some important respects, it is possible that American views of evolution are changing. In other ways they may not, but in some ways they are. So that's where I'm going tonight. So uh, the COVID virus uh, and evolution. So uh, I added, uh, I, teach, uh, I teach evolution every summer at Scholl's Marine Lab. Cornell and UNH have, have a marine lab on, in, off the coast of Maine, and I teach evolution there every summer. This past summer, it was, of course, all online, uh, but I added a lecture on uh, the coronavirus and, uh, and what it had to do with evolution, and that uh, led me to learn a lot of stuff that I probably should have known a long time ago. Uh, one of the, the things that I found very interesting in preparing that lecture was to, to peruse a half dozen evolution college evolution textbooks. And over the last decade or so, college evolution textbooks have uh, uh, almost to the last one have added chapters on HIV as an example of applied evolution. And uh, they uh, uh, use that tool as a way of uh, presenting information about natural selection and and uh, and genetic themes, but uh, but also to make the case that that evolution is is a vital essential topic. And uh, so uh, a couple of these slides are lifted from uh, a really excellent textbook from 2019 by uh, uh, Doug Emlin and Carl Zimmer. Uh, so here is a uh, the influenza virus. And uh, just to remind everybody what a simple uh, thing a virus is, there's just not much to a virus. Uh, some genetic material inside uh, some proteins. Um, and if, if, if these can evolve, uh, then, then the, the, the books go on um, and, can, and can have such consequences, then um, evolution must be powerful indeed. So when you're reading these chapters on HIV in these textbooks, uh, it's pretty easy to realize that you could just substitute uh, coronavirus for that. Uh, so um, so two things, and this won't surprise uh, any of you, I don't think, uh, there are two really important points to make about viruses. Again, this is based in, in this textbook on, on the influenza virus, uh, but you could use uh, AIDS virus or you could use any virus. Number one, viruses change, viruses evolve. Uh, and what does that mean? It means that new variants arise by mutation and they change in frequency. And those are inevitabilities of the existence of viruses. And secondly, viruses have family trees. They have phylogenies. That is, they come from other viruses and you can in fact draw a family tree of viruses. And here in this textbook is a family tree of the influenza virus uh, for uh, the first decade of the 21st century. So here in this college textbook are two fundamental truths about viruses, that viruses evolve which means there are new mutants and those new mutants can change in frequency pretty dramatically, uh, either by natural selection or other mechanisms. And secondly, that they have phylogenies. They come from somewhere and they go somewhere and they show ancestor descendant relationships. And when you are just reading a textbook like this and you, and you come upon 
uh, something that somebody wrote in reference to something else, and you realize that it applies to your current situation, you kind of do a, a head slap and you say, how incredibly obvious. Uh, so here's the coronavirus. Uh, like all coronaviruses, it, it, it has this, uh, the reason coronaviruses are called coronaviruses is because they have this corona of these spike proteins uh, um, on the outside. And it's those spike proteins that are one of the primary mechanisms of its transmissibility. So anything that changes the spike proteins changes transmissibility, um, even if it doesn't affect virulence. So here's the cartoon that we've all become familiar with of, of, of what the coronavirus looks like. Um, so I, I in, in preparing this lecture that I gave last last summer, I uh, went and read uh, a lot of papers. That this was July, so uh, it was still early in the pandemic. Research, however, had been pouring out for a little while. So I went back and read some pre-pandemic uh, studies and found out what we what we know about uh, coronaviruses. And it turns out, no surprise, coronaviruses have a phylogeny. Uh, there are lots of different kinds of coronaviruses, and you can relate one to the other. Uh, groups of coronaviruses are more closely related to each other than they are to others, uh, which is one of the definitions of a phylogeny. So coronaviruses evolve in ways that leave branching relationships. And, that, and we knew this before the pandemic. And secondly, all human coronaviruses that are, that are known have uh, or their origins in non-human animals. That is, they're zoonotic. They, they, they uh, originate in non-humans and then are transmitted to humans. And SARS-CoV-2, the, the novel coronavirus, uh, there's no reason to think that it is otherwise. Now, when I uh, began to research this, the early studies that came out last spring were strongly suggestive of uh, the novel coronavirus originating in bats and being transmitted to pangolins. And then and at the time, there was a developing consensus that it went from pangolins to humans. And that was based on uh, doing uh, genetic studies like you see illustrated here. Uh, and this was a paper that came out in early uh, 2020. Uh, in the spring of 2020, showing that that the viruses in pangolins, this this particular virus in pangolins, seemed to be most close, uh, most similar, and therefore most uh, closely related to the the strain that was first identified in China. And so, at the time, it seemed like uh, this virus had originated in bats, moved to pangolins, and then somehow gotten to humans as well. Since then. This consensus has, has uh, been called into question. And uh, my reading of the literature uh, most recently is that, that no one's really sure exactly uh, what the origin was uh, right before humans. Could have been pangolins, could have been some other mammal. Uh, the consensus seems to be that it did originate in bats, but it, it's not clear what the connection was between bats and humans. But the point is there's, there's a phylogeny of the, this virus, and that it had previous mammalian hosts. That there's a there's a long relationship of 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 not only descent and modification, but of of phylogeny here. And this is exactly what that college textbook told us to expect, because this is what the influenza virus does. This is what all viruses do. So if you start um, uh, playing uh, Google with uh, these topics, then some patterns pop up pretty quickly in the literature. Uh, of course, in the technical literature, the word evolution shows up pretty frequently. And I found uh, several dozen papers without too much effort, uh, technical papers uh, from the biomedical literature that use the word evolution the way uh, evolutionary biologists do. Uh, that is, they're not using the word evolution to say the evolution of clinical care or something like that, uh, but the, the evolution of the virus. And um, so this isn't surprising, right? That, that uh, people who, are, who study viruses should use the word, would use the word evolution and the concepts of evolution to study these viruses. That's, that's no surprise. Um, 
the World Health Organization uh, has, uh, as recently as, as uh, just a couple months ago, um, has a, a lengthy article that's very explicit about the evolutionary history of the virus and uses the word, it uses the concept, talks about natural selection. Uh, you have to look a little harder, uh, un until recently, you have to look a little harder to, uh, if you go beyond the technical literature, uh, but um, to find notions that an evolutionary biologist would recognize. But nevertheless, I think that something interesting is happening here. And it's in no small part due to, to our friend, uh, Dr. Fauci, uh, who I need to point out to everybody who doesn't know uh, uh, is a Cornell alumnus. Um, so remember my first two points about viruses. They, they evolve, meaning they mutate and, they, and those mutants change in frequency. Well, way back last summer, new mutants or strains or variants, those words get used uh, sometimes uh, as synonyms, even when they shouldn't be, uh, were popping up. And this surprised a lot of people. There was all kinds of news about it. A new variant has popped up and this is news. We need to talk about this. Is this unusual? What are the consequences of this? When of course, anybody who knew anything about viruses or evolution knew that of course new mutants were going to arise. Uh, and then, of course, the uh, the questions were, what are the what are the uh, the properties of these new mutants? That's a different question. Uh, but nevertheless, when when Dr. Fauci started talking about this, and this is the earliest one of the earliest uh, public statements I can find. This is from July when he was first talking about this. He doesn't use the word evolution in this particular uh, article, but um, he's clearly talking about what we would think of as evolution. He's talking about new mutants happening and changing the virus because they're changing in frequency. Uh, but things began to change pretty quickly in the fall when, uh, in the late fall, when the two so-called South African and UK variants uh, popped up. Um, now, uh, the language of, of kind of science journalism began, begins to shift a little bit and starts talking about mutants not as unusual things, but as normal things. And then they begin to focus on change of relative frequency. And that, that, that it is the virus, uh, by, by having a mutant that is more communicable, the virus is by Darwinian mechanisms making itself into something else. Uh, by becoming more uh, infectious and communicable, its frequency is spreading uh, by, by natural selection. And uh, uh, science media begins to pick up on this um, and saying things like uh, the, all of the variants in a certain region or country might become something soon because of this new, this new mutant. Uh, and so uh, around the holidays, uh, December, January, the, the um, the science media and a little bit of the more popular media starts to uh, be filled with these articles. And I'm sure you, you all saw uh, these. And uh, the, again, the theme here is not just, oh, there's a new mutant. Oh, it might be more deadly. It's that it is more communicable and that has evolutionary consequences. And then uh, in January, uh, January 29th, uh, Dr. Fauci um, makes a, a public statement, which was covered in lots of, of uh, media outlets, but not all of them had this particular quotation in it that I've, that I've blown up here on the left. Uh, this is a wake-up call to all of us, Fauci said. We will continue to see the evolution of mutants, so we will have to be nimble and be able to just adjust readily to make versions of the vaccine that actually are specifically directed toward whatever mutation is actually traveling at any given time. Um, so now Dr. Fauci is using the term, the, the term and the concept of evolution openly and, and talking about it as the way an evolutionary biologist would. And uh, as the, the, these variants have become more important in uh, differing areas, different countries, um, you start seeing quotations like this. Uh, this is an article about 
uh, just the phenomenon of recombination, uh, which the headline writer here calls mixing its genome, uh, but it's just good old fashioned recombination. And I'm, I'm fascinated how, how often does even the New York Times quote somebody who is identified as an evolutionary geneticist. So here's an evolutionary geneticist uh, being quoted about the nature of the coronavirus. I'm not naive here. I don't think this is going to, this is going to change uh, the way America sees the virus, but I detect that uh, not only will subsequent editions of textbooks uh, talk about this virus uh, uh, as an example of evolution, but it could possibly be that when we are talking about uh, communicable disease from now on, that it will be as possible to talk about the evolution of, of uh, viruses uh, of all kinds as it is to talk about why we have to get a different flu shot every year, which up until now has pretty much been our go-to example of, of um, how um, pathogens evolve. Okay, so that's thing number one. Thing number two uh, and it, you know, the, the, the number two non-political story of the year was clearly climate change, in my opinion. Uh, climate change is about so many things. What, what does it have to do with evolution? So uh, in, my, in the part of my life that I spend claiming to be a geologist, uh, or uh, as we're supposed to say these days, earth system scientist, um, the times that we live in right now are increasingly being called the Anthropocene. And, and nobody who studies uh, what we, most of us call the Earth system these days, nobody really debates that humans have become, if not the largest, then certainly one of the largest causal factors in what goes on at the Earth's surface. Uh, we are we are we are major geological actors now, and it's not a question of whether the Anthropocene is a different era. It's just the relatively arbitrary decision about when we should label it as having started. Here's just a partial list uh, of of kind of supporting evidence that humans are major geological actors. Tonight. Uh, since we're focused on evolution, I just want to focus on a couple of these um, and explore the question, uh, what's, what does evolution have to do with climate change? Or put, put it another way, when we're all talking about climate change, which increasingly many of us are, what does that have to do with evolution? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk, uh, just give you a couple of, of thoughts about evolution and climate change, but it's going to include these things down at the bottom, which are not always included in climate change. Uh, what's sometimes called biotic homo homogenization, which is all about introduced species. Um, extinction, which uh, is, is certainly part of evolution in the, in, in the macro sense. Um, and then also just changing abundance of species. Um, okay, so just so we're all on the same page, here's, here's some actual data uh, of the last, Hundred plus years, um, the not every part of the world is getting warm at the same rate, but the world's getting warmer overall. Um, and we all know that if we try to predict the future, uh, it's very difficult to do. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that we don't know what human behavior will be. And so that gives graphs like this from the IPCC. And so the difference between the blue curve and the orange curve is really not about scientific predictability, but about what humans are going to do in their behavior. So what we know is that uh, temperatures have already gone up uh, by a degree or so. Uh, and the question is just how many more degrees will they go up uh, in the next century or so? Will they go up by a degree or two? Or will they go up by uh, five degrees or more? And we're as certain as we can be about uh, anything in science that this is what's going to happen. Okay, so that's just the backdrop. So what does that have to do with evolution? We're talking about something on a hundred year scale. What does that have to do with evolution? Well, let me just raise five items here as what evolutionary biologists might be thinking, are thinking about 
contemporary climate change and why when we're thinking about climate change, we need to be thinking about evolution. Uh, and these aren't in any particular order. Uh, so coral reefs. So um, you all uh, know something about coral reefs. They're distributed in warm latitudes. Um, it, it, and, uh, and at one level, you would expect uh, the tropics to be buffered because we keep hearing that the poles are the one uh, are the areas that are being more affected by by uh, climate change. Uh, but of course, uh, coral reefs had a bunch of uh, burdens already. Um, they were being affected by all kinds of other anthropogenic influences, and uh, climate change is is making all of that worse. Uh, turns out, corals can only live. Not only do corals not like it when it's cold, but corals don't like it when it's warm, too warm. Um, and so uh, there are lots of negative effects on corals of higher temperatures. One of them is bleaching, uh, which is the expulsion of zooxanthellae from their, their symbiotic algae from their tissues, which doesn't kill them. It's not the same thing as death, but it can lead to death if, it, if, if they don't get better. Uh, and, and high temperatures uh, exacerbates this problem. Um, and bleaching is an increasingly widespread event. And this is a map of just episodes of coral bleaching. And depending on those IPCC graphs about predictions for the future, uh, then the predictions as to what will happen as a result of bleaching and associated uh, ill effects from warming suggest that there may be no living coral reefs uh, by 2100. That is not the same thing as a mass extinction of coral species, but uh, there's, there's, there, there are very serious thoughtful people that have suggested there may be no functioning coral reef ecosystems the way we think of them now um, by the time my daughter uh, is 93 years old, which is 2100. Um, by the way, I, just, I can't help, I can't resist. Um, uh, when you're talking uh, to uh, groups about climate change, uh, which my experience has been that you're talking to a bunch of old people most of the time, and I've actually had people say, well, I don't care because I'm going to be dead by then. Um, I figured out a, a, a while ago that the way to, to, to do this is to ask them to think of somebody that will be alive in 2100. Uh, and um, that has worked for me very well. It certainly works for me personally because, as I said, my daughter will be 93 years old. Um, so the concept that there may be no functioning coral reefs ecosystems in 2100, even if there's no mass extinction of coral species themselves, is an evolutionary catastrophe. Any paleontologist can tell you that all five of the big five mass extinctions that we know about over the last 500 million years, all of them have been associated with a collapse of reef ecosystems. Reef, reefs are the most diverse environments in the oceans today. A collapse of reef ecosystems would absolutely mean uh, a, an evolutionary and, and environmental and ecological catastrophe in the ocean. Uh, and if that's not an evolutionary uh, event, then I don't know what is. Uh, okay, so um, what else is climate doing that's of evolutionary interest? Importance. So uh, this seems this seem this particular example seems so benign uh, that I I almost didn't want to use it. But then I I thought to myself that it's it's an example of the of the uh, of the widespread nature of this effect. So this is uh, a little butterfly called Edith's checker spot butterfly. Uh, it lives uh, on the Pacific. Uh, coast region of North America. And it turns out that this little butterfly um, is changing its geographic range over the last several decades. More population extinctions are happening at lower latitudes as temperatures rise. And so the, the population center of this particular species is moving northward. Now, this is one butterfly species, and uh, even if you like, even if you love butterflies, you may say, "Well, who cares about one butterfly?" But just consider what the implications are of any species changing its its geographic range when it has a, a such a large geographic range as this particular species. Think about it. 
This means that this butterfly is, is going to leave eventually habitats where it currently is distributed. It's going to enter habitats where it currently does not exist. It's going to change its relative abundance throughout the remainder of its range. Things that eat it, things that it eats, are going to react differently. So the smallness of this example, I think, is part of its power that uh, we are changing by changing global temperatures, we are changing the distribution of species one at a time. And they are reassociating themselves. I'll say more about that uh, in a second. Uh, my colleague, uh, Katie Bagnall Newman, is going to talk in a couple of weeks about, um, uh, about maple trees. Um, I don't want to steal her thunder, but um, in, in our part of New York State, you can be guaranteed to get people's attention when you're talking about climate change if you say uh, that by the time, um, uh, by 2100, uh, there will be very few, if any, sugar maples in New York State. Uh, so on the left is today, on the right is 2100. Um, and this basically says that there will be uh, almost no functioning uh, uh, sugar maple forests, sugar bushes uh, in New York State. Uh, we're getting ready to have our, our uh, Maple Fest celebration here in Ithaca in a few months, a couple months. And uh, we always try to point this out to people while they're enjoying their, their maple syrup. Um, maple trees aren't going to go extinct, but they're going to disappear from much of their range throughout New England uh, and New York State. And that's going to change the forest, both where it leaves and where it where it remains. And this is, and you can say, well, that's but one butterfly and one tree. But actually, this this table, the details aren't important. This table just summarizes uh, more than 30 such studies, and this is 15 years old. There's been dozens more since then. Um, that basically says this is happening all over the world. Um, that the ranges of species are moving uh, quite substantially now. Um, and this is not a minor event of a few species. Uh, this, is a, this is a pattern that's developing all over the globe that species are reassorting themselves and, um, and, and, and putting themselves into new arrangements. And I'll say more about that in a second. Okay, but you might be still, still might be saying, well, that's not really evolution, Warren, because evolution means like you grow new horns or something. Well, what about the, the shapes of organisms? Well, it turns out that um, there's a huge literature, a gigantic literature about changing phenotypes due to climate change. For example, uh, fish uh, are getting, uh, uh, are changing their sizes. Um, snails are changing their sizes. Birds are changing their sizes. But when you actually read the papers carefully, what you find out that a lot of those changes are what uh, biologists call uh, uh, phenotypically plastic. They are not uh, the effects of genetic change. They're the effects of, uh, the, I you always use the example of getting your hair cut. Um, if you get your hair cut, you've changed your, your phenotype, but you haven't evolved. Um, so uh, you have to read the literature carefully. There is less literature, but still a growing body of literature. Uh, I've just given you a few examples here that say that evolution is actually happening in the shape and size uh, of organisms uh, due to climate change. And the principal pattern that seems to have, have uh, that seems to have the most support is indeed that species, many, many species are getting small. Their body sizes are, their mean body sizes are decreasing as temperatures rise. And uh, so you, you're can you have to cancel out the effect of of uh, phenotypic plasticity, of, of them changing within their lifetime uh, due to the environment. Uh, but there's pretty convincing evidence that, that species from birds to marine mammals uh, to invertebrates are getting, uh, their body size is getting smaller genetically uh, uh, by natural selection due to higher temperature change, uh, higher temperatures. So, Climate change, anthropogenic climate change, is actually changing the shape of organisms. It's changing the geographic range of organisms. In other words, it's recombobulating the biosphere, species at a time. 
If you add all those species together, you get what I personally find most surprising about what's going on right now. And that is what conservation biologists are coming to call novel ecosystems or novel communities. And in a way, I think this is, it would be, it would be totally fascinating and exciting if it wasn't so um, sobering and, and a little depressing. What this says is that humans have already fundamentally changed what we, what I grew up thinking was quote unquote nature. If you look out your window, wherever you are, I guess it's dark where we all are now, but if, if it was light outside, wherever all of you are, and you looked out the window, chances are that you would be looking outside at a, at a, at a set of organisms that not only were not all native there, in other words, were uh, prior to uh, the last couple of centuries uh, weren't there, but you would be looking at completely or partially different biological communities, different food webs, different predator-prey relationships, different relative abundances, differing structures of the way these organisms are living not just different species, but different organizations of species. So in other words, we, we are trained to think, or at least those of us, I guess, who aren't professional conservation biologists who don't do this for a living, are trained to kind of think endangered species. We save them one at a time, or we preserve some habitat, we save a bunch of species, and that's, that's what we really should be doing. While, in, while all that's happening, nature's reorganizing itself in response to human effects. And they're reorganizing them, themselves, these species, and coming up with completely new arrangements that aren't just missing a species or with an additional species, they're just different. They're completely different. So there is now a, a, a global urban avifauna. And you all know what is in it. It's these three species that are on the screen, right? In, in a huge majority of the temperate world, the European starling, the European sparrow, and the, the common rock dove are a brand new community that live with each other and, and react to each other. And that did not exist 200 years ago. Uh, here in New York, there is a completely different ecosystem than 200, 250 years ago. White deer with no large predators, uh, and except cars and, and guns. Um, that's, that ecosystem did not exist here 200 years ago. And if you're a marine biologist and you go to the coast of New England, um, there is a community that in some ways bears almost no resemblance to what existed two or 300 years ago. It's filled with snails and crabs, and in some cases other things like, like tunicates and, and seaweeds and sponges, that not only weren't here, but were, were, there was not even an equivalent. So we're, we can say, well, it, we haven't gotten rid of any species, so where's the, where's the harm? This is evolution, folks. This is changing the structure of ecosystems that will change the baseline for future evolution. Evolution, the toothpaste is out of the tube. You know, the, the evolution is not going to be the same after this. And this is not something that's only happening, you know, in Central Park and Bar Harbor, Maine. This is something that's happening globally. And lastly, and you all know about this one uh, because of endangered species, um, but I wanna just give this a little bit of personal spin because I, I tell my students this all the time um, because it, it, this particular story really meant something to me personally, this particular chain of events. So I was a graduate student uh, in the 1980s, uh, from 1982 to 1988. And this article came out in Science Magazine in uh, my second year of graduate school. And I remember, uh, I'm, I'm old enough to remember that when Science and Nature came out, you actually stopped and read the magazine. And um, so I remember flipping through this. And basically what this article says is, uh, this is a, a, a meeting summary of a, of a meeting that took place with some pretty heavy hitter biologists. Uh, Paul Ehrlich and Dan Simberloff are mentioned here 
uh, are pictured here. Uh, and the, this meeting uh, was a discussion of what some of the meeting participants were, were calling um, a coming mass extinction. And they were ruminating. There, was, there wasn't much data at the time at all, but they were ruminating that uh, it could be that humans might be actually could in the future, uh, and the phrase kept popping up, if current trends continue, uh, might actually be causing a mass extinction. Now you'll notice 1983, this was uh, pretty close to the peak of the, uh, what, what I remember as uh, the mass extinction wars uh, of the 1980s. This was after the, the Alvarez impact scenario had come out. It was when the big five mass extinctions had just been named. Um, this is when extinction periodicity was being talked about and comets zipping around the solar system and killing things and so forth. Extinction was in the, was in the, the water that we were all talking about. And so here's this paper saying uh, humans might cause the sixth extinction. Okay, so the grad students, I remember talk, talking with our, my fellow grad students about this and we, we, we kind of got kerfuffled about it and, and we, we talked to a couple of our, of our professors and and we said, boy, what do you think about this? And, and I remember clear as day uh, that uh, they thought it was fringe science, uh, that this is alarmism or fringe science or wackiness or, oh, come on, give me a break kind of stuff. Well, you know uh, how the story ends. Um, the sixth mass extinction is now a meme. Uh, it started, as far as I can tell, with that particular meeting and an article in Science Magazine, but uh, there are at least three books by that title. Uh, Elizabeth Colbert's is, is the most, uh, is the best of the three and, and is a great read. Um, uh, but it's also, it's also broken through into, into mainstream science. And uh, there are, there's at least a major article every month or two um, in Science, Nature, PNAS, et cetera, uh, about the sixth mass extinction and they, and using that phrase. And uh, it's gone from uh, this could happen if current trends continue to uh, this is already happening to here's what the consequences will be of it already happening. Um, this is now one of those things that has gone from, oh, give me a break to, you know, how could we not have seen it uh, already? Uh, this is macroevolution, right? This is, if this really is the sixth mass extinction, and some of these papers, by the way, say that it started a long time ago, uh, 10,000 years ago in some cases. Uh, this is macroevolution. If this is the sixth mass extinction, then we can expect it to have the macroevolutionary consequences of the other five, which were arguably the biggest events in the history of life since its origins, or since the Cambrian explosion. So, and climate change is not, uh, the, the sixth mass extinction is, is not only caused by climate change by any means, but it's certainly being exacerbated by climate change. And uh, everybody uh, who thinks about it agrees to that, that kind of like corals, uh, the species were already in trouble and climate change is kind of pushing them over the edge. So humans are not just changing a butterfly or changing the, uh, the range of a butterfly or the body size of a snail humans are changing the fundamental fabric of the biosphere. We're rearranging the communities and we're causing a mass extinction. And this will have, if it is a mass extinction, which we think it is, it will, history tells us, have consequences that will last hundreds of millions of years. And so, uh, Conservation Biology 101 tells you always go with the uh, charismatic megavertebrate when you're trying to get people's attention. So that's why polar bears going extinct due to climate change is uh, you know, a sure winner, right? With fundraising and getting people's attention. So polar bear faces extinction and everybody gets uh, agitated about it, uh, due, and mainly due to climate change. Everybody can understand that. Um, it's a little bit harder when you start talking about animals like this, um, this uh, has the, the wonderful uh, name of the Mary River turtle, uh, which uh, grows algae on its head. Um, 
and uh, turns out to be highly endangered. We are, like all mass extinctions, we are threatening to change the course of macroevolution. I guess I shouldn't say threatening. We are changing the course of macroevolution in large part due to climate change. Okay, so part three, and this, this is a mixture of, um, of good news and uh, a cautionary tale. So uh, I know some people uh, in the group tonight teach these kinds of subjects. So perhaps you're familiar with this graph. Uh, the Gallup organization started asking Americans uh, their views on human evolution uh, in the 19, early 1980s. And it's one of the more interesting data sets out there in kind of understanding of public understanding of science because they've asked the same questions repeatedly over this long period of time. So uh, they, they do this poll. I'm, I'm not sure if they do it. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what their schedule is. It's not quite regular. Um, they do it every few years. And so this gives a, um, a uh, kind of series of snapshots of where public opinion is about, hum about uh, American understandings and, and feelings about evolution. Now, let me just give a quick disclaimer here. Uh, I just gave an entire lecture in, uh, in the human evolution course at Cornell about this. Um, the answers to questions like this depend to a very large degree on the nature of the question. So if you ask a question one way, you'll get a slightly different answer than if you ask the question another way. So I'm, I'm not discounting that effect, which is, which is actually a very important effect, but I'm, I'm focusing on this because this question has been asked in more or less exactly the same way over uh, the last 40 years. So if you're not familiar with the Gallup poll, uh, what they do is they, they ask you, um, which of the following statements comes closest to your views on the origin and development of human beings? They don't actually use the word um, uh, evolution and that's on purpose. So they give you three choices. Uh, choice number one uh, is, God created man or humans uh, in their present form. And that's the gray line on this graph. That's the top line uh, on this graph. Uh, and then they, uh, then they give you the uh, option, uh, man or humans developed, but God played no part at all. And that's the dark green line on this graph down at the bottom. And then uh, there's an intermediate, uh, what's usually viewed as an intermediate answer, which is man or humans developed, uh, by which they mean evolved, with God guiding. Uh, that's their word choice. And that's this light green line in the middle here. So, um, they, and, and for, for decades, this has been seen as a, a straightforward question about how Americans feel about evolution. Uh, if they answer God created man in, its, in, in his present form, then they're creationists, right? They don't like evolution. If they answer man developed and God had no part, then they're straight secular evolutionists. Um, and if they say uh, humans developed or evolved with God guiding, then they can't make up their mind. Um, the, the, the headline of this poll for all the, most of the last 40 years has been the top two lines here, okay? It's the gray line, which has hovered somewhere in the 40s, right, as you can see, and the green line, which has hovered somewhere in the high 30s. And when you add those together, you get roughly 70-ish percent, something like that. And the punchline, the headline can be 60 or 70 percent of Americans doubt evolution. Um, and, and really not much attention has ever been paid to this dark green line down at the bottom. But when this poll came, when this particular version of the poll came out in July of 2019, uh, a bunch of, of uh, scholars of, of society and religion immediately noticed something. And it turns out, if you're not a follower of, of this literature, that it reinforced sociological trends that, that people had been noticing for some time. So I draw your attention to the dark green line down here at the bottom, where it says that in 2012, 15% of Americans said, man developed, but God had no part. In 2018, it was 19%. And in 2019, it was 22%. In other words, the line at the bottom that has generally been taken to represent 
completely secular evolutionary views has been on a pretty steady rise. And when you combine that with the gray curve at the top, which is actually at its lowest, the last two polls in 2017 and 2019, it's at its lowest ever. And so it turns out that if you are a scholar of sociology of religion in America, this fits into a, a storyline. The storyline is that American society is in transition, that American society is still the most religious of, of industrialized societies, but American society is undergoing a transition, uh, that, that, that the religiosity of Americans is, is changing. Um, I'm not a sociologist of religion, um, so I will have no opinion on that. I just note that this is interesting. Uh, it's the first time in my career when the headline has not been um, most Americans uh, don't think evolution is true. It's still true that most Americans think evolution is not true, but uh, these numbers are different. And the last point here is um, many of you probably recognize the graph on the left. It's the uh, it's the graph that you want to use, if you're an American, it's the graph you use to apologize to your European colleagues um, for, for American uh, lack of knowledge of evolution. If you're not an American, it's the graph that you show to, to show how uh, American science education is awful. Uh, if you haven't seen this graph before, it was a poll done uh, in 2005 of 34 industrialized countries. Uh, and it simply asked, do you accept evolution? Different question than the Gallup question, but related. And you can see the, the result here at the top are countries in Scandinavia, France, Japan, the UK. At the bottom are Lithuania, Latvia, Cyprus, Turkey, and the United States. And this says basically that 40% uh, of Americans think evolution is true, 40% uh, of Americans think evolution is false, and 20% aren't sure. Um, that was 2005. The Pew Research Organization, which studies uh, uh, religion in American life quite a bit, uh, released a new poll last year, a new international poll. It's fascinating. It's filled with all kinds of bits, but let me just show you one. Here is the result of asking that same question in a bunch of countries and actually a much more diverse set of countries than the, uh, than the 2005 poll. That's a whole story too, which we, we could talk about more Muslim countries, more Asian countries. Anyway, the point is that, and they also broke it down by, uh, in red here, it says Christian. In uh, that kind of, that, that grayish color, it says unaffiliated. That means religious, but no affiliation with a formal religion. And then it says all adults, okay? So there's three numbers. And if you go down to the US, this number right here in pink says 54%. So 54%, say of Americans who are Christian, who would self-identify as Christian, 54% say humans have evolved over time, 54%. If you ask what's the proportion of unaffiliated, 89%. And if you take all American adults of all uh, religious persuasions, the number is 64%. So 64% compared to something like 40-ish percent down here. Uh, so we are no longer at the bottom. We are, um, uh, we are clearly, uh, we have different opinions based on our professed faiths, but we are no longer at the bottom of industrialized countries. So this is, the, these, these polls are, are neither good news or bad news, they're just news. They record, uh, changes in U.S. opinion about this complex topic, and they re record these changes in complex ways. Um, it depends on how you ask the questions, of course, but putting that aside, uh, something is happening in America. Um, it may not keep happening, but something's happening. If you are an evolution educator, you can pat yourself on the back and say you're doing a better job. Uh, if you are, are interested in science education, you could say maybe we finally figured out how to do a better job. Um, or you can be a glass half empty person and say, this is just a blip and it'll go back the other way. But it's the first time since these polls have started that these kinds of results have shifted in this direction. Okay, now before we 
get all excited and and say thanks for ending on a positive note, Warren. I I just want to sober us up and uh, since this is a pub related event, I want to try to sober us up before we go out into the night. Um, ran across this article in uh, December. Um, this is an article uh, about the ex, the, the, the just uh, just departed White House Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows. Um, and I suppose I ended up seeing it because of its backdrop there. It's got a dinosaur in the picture. Um, anyway, the substance of this article is that Mark Meadows, uh, whatever his politics, um, turns out to be a young earth creationist. Um, it turns out that Mr. Meadows um, got in a little bit of trouble, some legal trouble, uh, because in 2018, he failed to disclose some income. And that income was $11,000 a month related to the sale of a deed to a Colorado fossil park dedicated to promoting the creationist idea that humans coexisted with dinosaurs. If you read more carefully, it turns out that Mr. Meadows in 2002 took his family on a, on a fossil hunt uh, sponsored by uh, some creationists, which uh, had the intent of discovering what the Bible says about dinosaurs and the great flood. And if you know anything about creation, American creationism, you know that these expeditions are quite popular among some creationists. They go down the Grand Canyon, they go fossil collecting, and it's all about uh, uh, saying that evolution is, is young, the Earth is young or evolution is wrong. So it turns out that the uh, White House Chief of Staff uh, is a young Earth creationist. Um, and yes, I know he's not the White House Chief of Staff anymore, but he was the White House Chief of Staff. And uh, we have actually a fairly long history of having creationists in high government positions. They were in the Reagan administration, they were in the first Bush administration, uh, and probably a lot of other administrations. Um, uh, people with these anti-science ideas uh, live in the highest uh, echelons of our government, no matter who's in charge. And I wanna end on perhaps the most sobering note of all. Um, some of you who follow the Discovery Institute, I mentioned it earlier, the Discovery Institute uh, was the, the, the brain trust behind the intelligent design law that was passed back in Dover, Pennsylvania, way back in the 90s. Um, uh, and um, if, you, if you have been following the Discovery Institute, you know that they pivoted a few years ago after the Kitzmiller Dover decision. Uh, intelligent design is no longer their bread and butter. Um, they are now devoted to not just um, complaining about evolution education and evolution, but they're devoted to uh, complaining about climate change education and uh, climate change denial, and particularly fighting climate change education. And so uh, in one of the most um, interesting things going on in science education in America right now, the National Center for Science Education, which is one of my favorite organizations, a little outfit in California, which pretty much single-handedly uh, helped wrangle the, the Dover trial uh, toward a successful end, um, is now also devoted to fighting climate change denialists in education. So we have the Discovery Institute, which was uh, uh, fomenting intelligent design, now fomenting uh, create, uh, climate change denial, once again battling with uh, the National Center for Science Education, who is fighting evolution denial and climate change denial. Um, and uh, so send, please send your checks to the National Center for Science Education. Um, so if you follow the, the Discovery Institute, you will uh, sometimes, if you're not careful and you're Googling, you'll end up on this page. It's called Evolution News and Science Today. And if you didn't know better, you'd think, oh, I've landed on a news site about evolution. But this is actually this this news site is actually run by the Discovery Institute, and uh, so uh, I found this article came out last August, uh, and there's a, I suppose it's not a horrible caricature, it's not an ugly caricature, but it, you might think that it's a little bit deprecatory caricature of Dr. Fauci, uh, and when you read this this article, uh, it is a really 
really virulent attack on Dr. Fauci. In this case, not for masks, not for disagreeing with the president, uh, but for advocating what C.S. Lewis called scientocracy put in charge. So what is, as is so often the case with creationism, what's really going on here is not what is at the surface. What's really going on here has to do with the culture wars more broadly. It always has, it always will. Uh, that what is sometimes thought of as pesky creationism uh, that we really don't have to worry about is really an attack on the fundamental uh, importance of science and value of science, which given the events of the last year, we don't have to discuss. Um, attacks on science are not just about the coronavirus. Attacks on science are about all of science. And they're right below the surface. Sometimes they come up to the surface. Um, and so understanding not only the coronavirus and climate change, but understanding our society itself is impossible if you don't understand evolution, which as is so often the case, brings us back to both Charles Darwin and Theodosius Vipsius. So please tomorrow, uh, um, give your favorite Darwin picture a hug. Um, it is Dar tomorrow is the 212th anniversary of Charles Darwin's birth. I wish you all a happy Darwin day. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Warren. And uh, um, I will uh, note that uh, uh, I'm going to open it up for questions. I know there is one waiting in the chat. Um, as we take a look at that, I'll also put a link in for our uh, donation um, uh, to PRI, reminding you that we are a nonprofit. And, and are bringing you this service for free. So we welcome your donations. Um, and uh, Jacob asked, back to the questions, Jacob asked, will a corona coronavirus shot every year be a sufficient solution to the pandemic or is the coronavirus quote, better at mutation compared to the flu? The only thing I'll say about that, because that's completely above my pay grade to answer that question. But the only thing I'll say is that you asked uh, a question, is it is it, uh, is it different? Um, and the cons at least my reading, and this is literally only based on my reading, um, the, the consensus is that it is not a fundamentally different thing it is in, in terms of its behavior, in terms of its mutation behavior. There was all kinds of literature at the beginning talking about whether it was more or less mutatable, um, more or less variable, uh, faster evolving, less evolving. Um, that, literature seems to have gone away, that it does not seem to be an exceptional coronavirus in terms of its mutation rate. Um, and so uh, that, that's just my reading of the literature, which is where we are right this second. Um, so what does that mean for your question? I'm not really sure, but I think what it means is that, uh, that we're going to have to treat it like we treat other viruses. It's not going to be different than other viruses in that respect, in its, in its evolvability, I guess I'll put it that way. Thank you. That's comforting to hear. Well, I don't know if that's true, but. <laughs> <laughs> and there are a number of um, uh, thank yous and, and praise in the chat. Um, well, uh, the, I know that some of you are regulars at this event. Um, Please keep coming back and, and thank you, Don, for doing all the heavy lifting to organize uh, this every two weeks. I, I thoroughly enjoy it. Um, there is another question that was uh, sent directly to me. Are there any examples of evolutionary biology research that has helped better understand climate change in any way? Wow. Yeah, that's an interesting question. That's a really interesting one. I'll have to think about that one. Um, it doesn't pop to mind, but uh, there are probably people on this call that could that could answer that better than me. It doesn't pop to mind, but well, I think it. I think I can't cite specific examples, but I I strongly suspect there are there are examples of evolutionary biology research 
that has helped us think about how to respond. Yes, to that's true, change. for sure. That's true. That's yeah. resiliency and, and response. Yes, that's yeah. true. Um, I, Ingrid asked a really interesting question. Um, it, do, do conservation biologists or evolutionary biologists think that a sixth extinction is inevitable? That's a great question because um, the reason it's a great question is because it's exactly the same kind of question as how much warming is baked in. If, if the CO2 turned off tomorrow, how much would the, war, the, the globe warm? And you, maybe you, most of you know that there's somewhere around another degree or a degree and a half baked in if we turned it off tomorrow, um, depending on some other assumptions. Um, it's the same thing with extinction. So if, if we somehow manage to heal coral reefs tomorrow, then obviously that would have a major positive impact on a pending mass extinction. If we somehow stopped cutting rainforest tomorrow, that would have a, a very positive impact on a pending mass extinction. And if climate change stopped tomorrow, or if, sorry, if, if, if the sea turned off tomorrow, that would dramatically impact future extinction. But it's the, unfortunately, I think it's the same answer as the IPCC answer, which is, uh, it, it's often called the business as usual answer. The business as usual scenario that IPCC talks about is if we keep doing everything the way we're doing it right this second, then 2100 will be as much as five or six degrees warmer than pre-industrial temperatures, which is bordering on catastrophic. Yeah, I would say not bordering. <laughs> yeah. so, so it's the same thing. If, if you think about just the extinction consequences of a five degree rise and the destruction of coral reefs and the destruction of rainforests, et cetera, et cetera, then they're, then at that point, they become quite closely linked. So, Ingrid, I think I would have to say it's almost the same question as if, if, we, if, if it's business as usual, then, you know, there have been some successes, right? I mean, look at, look at all the successes we have in conservation. There are huge successes, incredible successes. But those will not, and those successes could persist, right? We could have bald eagles and blue whales for the next thousand years. But we could still have a mass extinction over the next, you know, thousand years um, if current trends can. And two more questions have popped in. So, uh, the first is from Kristen. Kristen asking, uh, I teach middle school. Do you have any recommendations on how to address this topic with younger humans that relate to all the research you mentioned, that relates to all the research you mentioned? That's a great question. I am. I would never say that I'm an expert in how to teach anybody who's younger than college. Um, so I would just say that I've mangled a bunch of stuff into one big ball tonight. Um, I would tease apart some of the things that, that I've mentioned. Um, my experience in teaching about evolution to, general, to the general population is that most people are familiar with influenza shots every year. Most people are familiar with, with antibiotic resistance. Most people are familiar with uh, uh, dogs and cats and tomatoes and corn. And that's where you start talking about evolution. Um, and um, the, the question of young audiences is always, how, do, how much do you scare them? And, uh, I, and I am no expert on that. I tend to scare the bejesus out of them, which is why I'm not an elementary school teacher. Um, so I think I think we have an I think we have an obligation. My my daughter, as I've mentioned, my daughter's just about to turn fourteen, and she's at the stage where she's waking up and figuring out that the world is not in a nice place, in in a lot of respects. And we're not sheltering her from that, but we're trying to emphasize the positive. So, um, I think that as they get into t you know just before high school, I think we should we have an obligation to to start telling them the truth and still emphasize what's positive because that's where all hope lies. But um, to do otherwise is just a disservice at this point. Now, whether you do that to a six-year-old, I would never hazard, hazard a, an opinion. I think six-year-olds are totally able to understand evolution, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But I, as for the doom and gloom stuff, I've never been clear on how much, on how you teach kids about the end of the world. Yeah, um, well, one of my, 
taglines is uh, it's too late. Let's get to work anyway. You know, recognizing that we're always too late in responding to disasters, but that doesn't mean don't respond. Um, okay, next question um, isn't uh, it says the human body can evolve and I think it flipped around a little bit. Can the human body evolve and create a new protection against the coronavirus? Ooh, that's another one outside my pay grade. Um, in theory, absolutely, but not as fast as the virus can evolve. Yep. Virus can evolve a whole lot faster than we can. Um, you know, humans have evolved resistance to all kinds of things, um, but it's taken hundreds or thousands of years, usually thousands. Um, so yes, in principle, absolutely, but not fast enough to matter right now. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, and uh, Kristen, who asked the question about middle schoolers, says, thank you. I personally feel that kids are ready to hear the truth younger than we expect. And I agree. Um, and uh, Steve um, said pesticide resistance. I'm not sure. That's also a, a good one that certainly rural audiences understand. I've, I've had good success with talking about pesticide resistance mm -hmm. in upstate New York, for example. Yep. Um, uh, but like uh, like climate change, some of you may know that um, if you ask rural uh, audiences, if you ask farmers, uh, I don't know if this is still true, but a couple of years ago, a few years ago, um, my colleagues at PRI and Cornell um, polled a bunch of, of uh, rural uh, residents in upstate New York about their views on climate change. And, and they found, and other studies have found the same thing, that if you call it climate change, they don't want to talk about it. But if you call it extreme weather, they're very eager to talk about it. Um, and um, that's, I think that's become even more, more so, more true as the extreme weather has gotten more extreme. Same thing with evolution. If you talk about pesticide resistance, then everybody wants to talk to you. If you talk, if you call it evolution, nobody wants to talk to you about it. So um, it's, you know, there's now a field called applied evolution. There's a journal called applied evolution. And so, you know, that, that is gradual. And, and as I mentioned before, it'll be fascinating to watch whether the coronavirus, the pandemic, will kind of move the needle a little bit on being able to talk more about the evolution of viruses, the way we talk about influenza and antibiotic resistance and so forth. That'll be interesting to watch. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And it's also worth noting that um, this is not, maybe not exactly uh, evolution related, but the um, prevalence of flu is down so dramatically yeah, this that's year, right. which, that's you know, right. if you, if you don't believe in masks, explain that for me <laughs> and, and social distancing. Um, and that's, that's really interesting. And, um, you know, Dr. Margolius, Dr. David Margolius, who was the mid January, uh, speaker, um, and is in Cleveland Metro health system so they they've essentially had zero cases of the flu in the entire mm. system this year interesting yeah 